thank you hard for, for joining us uh, this morning. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to hear about hear hear some of your thoughts. And uh, to start, I will read uh, uh, briefly the, the CV of Mr. Howard Marks. And thank you again. Mr. Howard Marks is co-founder and co-president of Oak Tree Capital Management. Since the formation of Oak Tree in '95, Mr. Marks has been responsible for ensuring the firm's investment philosophy, communicating closely with clients concerning products and strategies, and contributing his experience to, to big picture decisions relating to investments and corporate direction. Mr. Marks holds uh, a bachelor degree on, uh, from Wharton School, uh, University of Pennsylvania, a major finance and major in accounting and marketing from Booth School of Business at the University of Chicago. We've received the, the George Hay Brown Prize. Mr. Marks is an emeritus tr trustee and member of investment committee of Metropolitan Museum of Art. He's a member of investment committee of Royal Drawing School and is professor of practice King Business School, both in London. He serves in, on Shanghai International Finance Advisory Council and advisory boards of Duke Christian <laughs> University. He is an emeritus trust, trustee of University of Pennsylvania, where, where from 2000 to 2010, he, he chaired uh, the investment board. Thank you again to, to join us this morning. Uh, I will uh, ask uh, Marcus and, uh, and Anna to join us, and the floor is yours. So, good morning, everyone. Thank you all for being here. So we are in from not only our stakeholders, but also our, our friends. So Mr. Marx, I welcome you to our office. Thank you. Bom dia. Bom dia. <laughs> well, I'd like to start asking you if you could kind of tell us about yourself, about Oak Tree Capital, and about your career path, and why uh, back then the non-investment grade credit uh, class caught your attention so much when you were still an equity analyst. After completing the schools that were described, I the uh, investment research department at Citibank uh, in 1969 uh, as an analyst studying conglomerates and uh, business uh, equipment. And then we had the oil embargo uh, by the Arabs in. Uh, Can you hear me now? Yes, OK. So I joined Citibank in 1969 uh, as an equity analyst. And then in 1973, we had the OPEC oil embargo. And uh, that kind of uh, accelerated my progress because I was asked to uh, head up uh, the uh, research for energy and then basic industries like steel, metals, paper, uh, forest products, um, all of which had dried up because the bank was so uh, uh, attracted to the nifty 50 the growth stocks and all the all the non growth stock coverage had had disappeared and then the uh, when the embargo happened they didn't have any um, in 1978 I was asked to move over to the bond department and start a fund to invest uh, uh, invest in convertible bonds which nobody knew about or cared about it was a tiny market and I went from having I went from being the director of research with 75 people and a five million dollar budget to working by myself, uh, studying companies with no budget and no people, and I was very, very happy, because now I could immerse myself in a few situations where I could gain knowledge superior to other people and find great bargains. And you know, Warren Buffett talks about buying dollars for 50 cents. I think I was buying dollars for 75 cents, but still pretty good. Uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and so I concluded that, uh, you know, Specializing in markets that other people were not interested in was a great way to get an advantage. Um, and you have to have an advantage. If you want to have superior results, it doesn't come from wanting them. It comes from doing something about it. And you need a knowledge advantage. And then I was very fortunate. I was asked to start a fund for high-yield bonds. And up to this point in time, two things about the bond market. Number one, bonds were rated, triple A, down to F, and if you didn't have AAA, AA, single A, triple B, that was called investment grade. If you were below that, it was, uh, you couldn't issue a bond below investment grade. 
Now we had low rated bonds, but they had been issued as high grades and been and, and fallen into trouble, what we call fallen angels. Uh, but Michael Milken in round 77 had this idea that a low grade company should be able to issue bonds if they promised enough uh, interest to compensate for the risk. And this has been a major change in the whole investment world because remember before Milken, you had good bonds and bad bonds. You could issue good bonds, you couldn't issue bad bonds. Moody said that uh, uh, a B-rated bond, quote, fails to possess the characteristics of a desirable investment. In other words, it was not good. You couldn't do it. The one thing they didn't ask is, well, what about the price? Are you saying that there's no price at which a B-rated bond is worth buying? 80, 70, 60, 50, isn't there some price? Now, of course, the world is different. Now we, now we consider everything is worth buying at the right price as long as the return compensates for the risk. So this was really the beginning of the conversion of the mentality. And then um, uh, the other thing that changed is that bonds before that era were uh, studied on the basis of past and current financials. But it was considered um, speculative to think about the future in connection with bonds. They should be they should be solid based on current information, credit worthy. And of course, in, if you're gonna start investing in low grade companies, you better start thinking about the future and whether they're gonna survive, et cetera. So my equity background in thinking about the future was, was the right place to be. And, I, I, you know, prior to that, the bank invested in the Nifty 50, the 50, 50 greatest companies in America. And if you bought those stocks the day I got to, to work, uh, I think it was September 22nd of, of 69, and if you held them strongly for five years, you lost almost all your money in the best companies. Why? Because they had been too expensive. Again, nobody thought about price. And now I'm investing in the worst public companies in America, and I'm making money steadily and safely because we were bought buying them at the right price. So I concluded as a, as a result of that experience that it's not what you buy, it's what you pay. And there are very few things that, that where there's no price so low that they're attractive, and there are very few things so that there's no price so high that they're unattractive. Investing, I'll try this in English, because my Portuguese is not that good. But investing, successful investing, is not a matter of buying good things. It's a matter of buying things well. And uh, that's, that was really the conversion of, of me in that period. And so, uh, you know, I, I continued to invest in convertible bonds and high yield bonds. Uh, I moved from uh, Citibank to Trust Company of the West in 85. And then I was joined by my partner, Bruce Karsh, who had the idea of investing in distressed debt. And, you know, uh, now at this point, I had been uh, uh, buying high yield bonds for 10 years. Every once in a while, you buy a bond at 100, and then it goes bankrupt and falls to 10. And then you go on the bankruptcy committee and you negotiate the restructuring. And if you do a good job, you get 30. So you went from 10 to 30, 100 to 30. Well, Bruce's idea is why don't you cut out the 100 to 10 part and just buy a 10 and go to 30. So I think in 88 at TCW, we organized the first distressed debt fund from a mainstream financial institution. And that uh, has been extremely successful. We've been doing it now for 34 years. Uh, uh, every fund has, has had a, a, a good positive return. And the ones formed in the perfect times when there was a uh, crisis and uh, large amounts of distress have uh, returns, uh, gross returns before fees ranging from maybe 
20 up to, up to 55 or something like that without using any leverage. It just goes that shows the power of buying things when they're out of favor. People would say, what are you crazy? You're gonna buy the debt of a company that's bankrupt? How can you do that? Well, the answer is, like with high yield bonds, if most people won't do it, maybe you can find some bargains. If you look on the pile of things that everybody knows about, understands, likes, feels good about, accepts, you're unlikely to find bargains on that pile. The bargains are on the pile of the things that they won't touch. And that's been my history, and that's the origin of Oak Tree. So uh, after we were successful in distressed debt, we spread out into distressed mortgages, which became our real estate business today, and into distressed uh, investing in companies for the, for the purpose of gaining ownership of the company and control. And that became our private equity or we call it special situations business. So today we have uh, 100 and right, about 150 billion under management. Um, we are what's called an alternative investment manager. We're global in scale. Our, our basis is credit. Most of what we do is credit. Um, and we have a very simple investment philosophy. Uh, first of all, we were the first into most of these asset classes, and these are risk asset classes. Th let's there be no confusion. We're not talking about treasury bills here. And a as a consequence, when we started out, we said we're going to be the safe, dependable supplier in these markets, in these risky markets. And so we have a, a, an investment philosophy. We started Oak Tree in 95, and we, we wrote out the philosophy, and there are six simple tenets. Number one, our, our, our primary goal is risk control. And uh, our motto is, if we avoid the losers, the winners take care of themselves. And we have uh, a record of good competitive performance in the good times and highly superior performance in the bad times, which is, uh, in my opinion, when it's important to be superior. It's not, in my opinion, important to beat the market when the market does well. When the market does well, everybody makes a lot of money. Why is it important to beat the market when the market does well? And in fact, if you think about it, what does it take to beat the market when the market does well? And the answer is a substantial dose of risk, correlation, and beta. But if you have those things, what's gonna happen when the market does poorly? And the answer is you probably will do worse than the market. I think people, they're satisfied, and we, our clients are happy if we're right around competitive, normal, average returns in the good times, and then they're very happy if we outperform in the bad times, because the person over here and over here is complaining, I'm losing so much money, and our clients say, well, well, we're not having that experience. So that's what we provide, and we're very proud of that. Um, we've never had a, so now we've organized about 70 closed-end funds since 1988. We've never had a fund that had a negative return before fees. We had one fund where the fees ate up the return. Uh, and it had a negative return after fees. And I don't think that in any of our, so we now have about 20, 25 strategies. Uh, some of them are 35 years old, dating back to um, our beginnings at TCW in 1985, uh, seven, 37 years. And so we have a total of about 300 or 400 years of experience in each stra in the strategies put together. And in my opinion, I'm, I'm partial, I don't think we've ever had a bad year in any of those, a good year, in my opinion, is a year <coughs> in which you either keep up with the benchmark or beat it, or uh, make a very substantial absolute return. And on that basis, uh, using that as the definition of a good year, I don't think we've ever had a bad year. And I'm very proud of the consistency, and consistency is number two, risk control, Consistency, our clients don't want us to shoot for the very top and they don't want us to come out in the very bottom. They want steady, consistent returns, competitive or better. Number three, there are things we call less efficient markets, the ones I described. Not everybody knows about them, not everybody understands them, not everybody has all the data, not everybody knows about every offering. This is where we specialize, less efficient markets. 
Number four, we are highly specialized. So we do a, a relatively small number of things and we try to do them as well as possible. Number five is important. Our investment decisions are not driven by macro forecasts. I don't know who's in this room. We don't have an economist. We don't invite economists because, you know, uh, <clears throat> one of my heroes, John Kenneth Galbraith, said there are two kinds of forecasters, the ones who don't know and the ones who don't know they don't know. <laughs> and, and that's really our official posture. We are not. Uh, th nobody, if you think about it, everybody comes in, I think it'll be up 4%, I think it'll be up 3.5%, I think it'll be 4.5%. Nobody has a superior record as an economic forecaster. So why should economic forecasts dominate investment decisions? They shouldn't. We have opinions. I have opinions on these things. I'll express some of my opinions today in response to the questions, but I don't believe in my opinions, and neither should you. You shouldn't have believed in my opinions or anybody else's opinions because they don't know. And uh, basing investment decisions on macro forecasts is not a way to produce superior results. Why? Remember what I said in the beginning. You need a knowledge advantage. And in my opinion, with regard to the macro future, nobody has a knowledge advantage. And number six, we're not market timers. So you know, we don't get in, get out, get in, get out. It's very hard to do that correctly. We, we, what we do, and I'll talk about this, is we adjust our relationship between aggressiveness and defensiveness. Every portfolio has to include elements of aggressiveness and defensiveness, and the question is how you weight them. And we believe in changing our weighting when markets reach extremes of high and low, and the rest of the time, steady as you go. So that's Oak Tree, and uh, I hope that provides a basis for our discussion. I look forward to your next question. Number five. Okay, yeah, okay. Oh, now not working? working. Okay, working. now it's working. So thank you. Uh, so one of your memos that I like the most, which is uh, thinking about macro, you shed some light into having a, a macro outlook and investing according to it, which you just mentioned. So you make it very clear that everyone in the room does have an opinion about the future. I do, you do, everyone here does. But Oak Tree never makes an investment according to this solo outlook. So could you? Could you walk us through Oak Tree's investment process and how do you come up with this uh, no marker outlooks into the portfolio construction? Well, look, I, I think it's very simple. Um, most of the time, I asked for this board, now you'll see why. If you look at the chart of GDP, for example, most of the time it goes like this. Most of the time, the, the variation in the growth rate is very low. And most of the time, people project that it was up 2% this year, it'll be up 2% next year. And most of the time it is. We call that extrapolation, where you assume that what happened in the recent past and in the present will continue into the future. And most of the time, extrapolation works. But those forecasts are not profitable because everybody has the same view and everybody turns out to be right and nobody makes any money from that expectation. Now, once in a while, something happens unusual. And, and uh, the 2% the, the, the growth doesn't continue. It's either up five in a boom or down two in a recession. And so all the extrapolators are wrong. Usually there's one person sitting in an uh, office someplace or other who had it right. And that forecast is very valuable. But if you study these things, you find that, that the person who had it right never had it right before and will never have it right again. So nobody can consistently predict deviations from the norm. And a, 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 predi a correct prediction of a deviation from the norm would be very profitable, 
But it's hard to make those predictions because extrapolation is, is the rule most of the time, and it's very hard to invest in it. If, 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 if I came to you and I said, you know, the U.S. economy has gone up 2% a year for the last 10 years, next year it's going to go up 8 you wouldn't invest because you say, that's crazy. And, but if, I, if it goes up 8 that would have been a very valuable forecast. Now, if I come to you the next year, I say, this year it's going to be down 8 well, I'm probably not right because nobody has a record of doing this thing consistently. So what we have is a lot of forecasts of extrapolation which are correct, usually, but not profitable. And then a, an occasional forecast of deviation from trend, which is potentially profitable, but hard to make and hard to act on. So when I look at all forecasts taken together, they're not profitable. Um, we have in our business uh, a, a long history of, of a few people who got famous for being right once in a row. Uh, there was a guy named Joe Granville. In 1987, he predicted bad things, and in October 19th of 87, we had something called Black Monday. Now, if the stock market goes down 5% in a year, that's bad. In that case, it went down 22% in a day. Joe Granville was, all of a sudden, he was the smartest person in the world. But his next for correct forecast was in 2009, 22 years later. So the point is, virtually nobody is capable of, of consistently accurate non-consensus forecasts. And to me, that proves that that they that can't be done. There's the occasional f exception, but it, uh, my mother used to say, it's the exception that proves the rule. The rule is, it can't be done. Now, so then, and how do we do it? The people who depend on forecasts are usually part of a group called strategic investors or top-down investors. And what a strategic investor says is, this is what's going to happen to the economy next year. This is what's going to happen to the various sectors. This is what's going to happen to interest rates. This is what's going to happen to the industries. And this is, these are the companies that will do best. So a top-down view resulting in uh, the selection of individual companies and securities. Our approach is the opposite. Uh, we're what's called bottom-up. We just look for bargains. We don't have uh, pre-existing expectations about what the market will do, because these are usually wrong, which will be the best industries, maybe sometimes which will even be the best companies. We just look for individual securities that look cheap, and we try to buy them. You know, I, I, sometimes I say, we look, at, we, we look at a whole bunch of individual securities, and if you raise their hand, then they say, buy me, because I'm cheap. And um, we believe that it's possible to um, find bargains and to buy bargains most of the time. And most of the things that we uh, uh, conclude are bargains turn out to have been bargains and perform well. Not all, but nobody uh, bats a thousand, as we say in baseball. Um, um, but. And, and we buy these things generally without reference to uh, forecasts for the economy. Uh, now, you have to have some expectation because you build your model and you project what the, what, what the company will earn. You have to have some assumption. But we, the, we never say, oh, the economy's going to do great, so we'll buy this bad company. Or the economy's going to do very poorly, so we'll avoid that good company. Um, and I. It would be great to have an economic forecast which was correct. It's just that it's really hard to achieve it. And you know, I had uh, dinner with Warren Buffett uh, about five years ago, and he said something very interesting. He said, for a piece of information to be desirable, it has to satisfy two criteria. It has to be important, and knowing what the economy and interest rates and currencies will do could be very important. But number two, it has to be knowable. And I believe it's not knowable. And uh, especially, it's not knowable in a superior way. So again, 
this idea of having a knowledge advantage, I believe a knowledge advantage cannot be built on macro forecasts, economy, currencies, commodities. What we can know more about than others, where we can get a knowledge advantage, is the micro companies, industries, securities, and I think we have it. Howard, is this working? Okay. You see in your book the most important thing that one of the most important things an investor must have is second level thinking. And one step to achieve that is ask yourself who doesn't know that yet before investing? How do you know that the market hasn't already priced in an opportunity you see? Can you walk us through this process? Well, th this is this is the knowledge advantage we're talking about. And uh, when, so I wrote this book, it's called uh, The Most Important Thing, and uh, it's available both in English and, and Portuguese. Matter of fact, I think Portuguese was the first uh, language it was translated into. And um, basically what it says is that, again, it goes to this idea of, of, of a knowledge advantage. In order to do better than others in picking securities, by definition, you have to know something they don't know. So I, I believe that the, the first level thinker is kind of superficial and, 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 and shallow and not sophisticated. And I always use the example, my son says to me, Dad, we should buy the stock of Ford because they're coming out with a new Mustang and I hear it's gonna be great. And I would say to him, who doesn't know that? If everybody knows it, then it, the, it is, it's reasonable to believe that it is already priced in to the stock price. And so if it turns out to be true, it's not gonna be a source of profit. Profits come from really favorable surprises. So the first level thinker says Ford is gonna come out with a new Mustang, it's gonna be great. We should buy the stock. The second level thinker says Ford's going to have this great new Mustang, but it's not going to be great as great as everybody thinks. We should sell the stock. S the, the first level thinker says favorable events produce favorable stock price performance. The second level thinker says surprises with regard to events. Favorable surprises produce uh, uh, stock price appreciation. Uh, another term we can use for this is variant perception. Most people perceive A, you perceive B, so, that, so you have the potential for a divergence of opinion which will be potentially profitable. But of course, B has to turn out to be true. That's the hard part. You have to have a forecast which is different from that of others. That's easy but it has to be right. And usually, the, the, the consensus of opinion is fairly close to right most of the time, so it's not easy to have a different forecast which is superior. And uh, the last memo, <coughs> which, uh, you know, I try to publish these memos at least quarterly. Uh, I've been a little busier this summer, uh, and they've been coming out monthly, but the last one I think was published about two weeks ago, and it's entitled, I Beg to Differ. And it it, what it's about is how important it is to hold different views. Now let's think about that for a minute. If your views, your opinions, are the same as everybody else's, you'll probably take the same action as everybody else, and you'll have the same results as everybody else. That's pretty simple. So in order to have different results, you have to do something different which means in some way you have to think different. That, so that's, that stresses the importance of having a difference of opinion. But, as I said, it's not enough to be different. You have to be different and right. So, uh, you know, if, if, uh, if uh, everybody in this room thinks it's gonna be a sunny day tomorrow, then I could establish my uh, uh, distinction by saying, no, it's gonna snow tomorrow. But that's not gonna make you right. And in, in, uh, there was a second edition to, to this book called The Most Important Thing Illuminated, 
where uh, a bunch of <coughs> uh, uh, substantially uh, superior investors inserted their comments in the book. And uh, one of my friends, uh, Joel Greenblatt, who has a great record as an equity investor, said, you know, just because uh, five other people refuse to stand in the path of an oncoming truck doesn't mean you should. So you shouldn't be different for the purpose of being different. Only when you know something that you think the market doesn't know and only when you can be correct. And, you know, basically the way when you look at it, and you, the way you say, well, that's not incorporated in the price is because you, you say, based on conventional views, the, this, this is cheap, is, is uh, uh, reasonable. Based on my view, it's cheap. And then, of course, it's important to turn out to be correct. as well. So lots of people love your book here. It's the most important thing. So you dedicate three chapters for risk. Yes. You dedicate to recognize risk, to understand risk, and to control risk. Yes. So by observing that, is it correct for us to say that is risk the most important thing about the most important things? Right. Well, um, you know, uh, they're all the most important thing, except that this one is more important than the other important things. Uh, I, I really think that risk control is very important. And I think that the, in my view, the risk controller is the superior investor. That superior investing records are built on risk controls. Now let me draw you another picture and see if I can turn this into a picture that makes sense. You find something and it's selling here. And um, basically, let's, let's, let's make this really simple. If you get good outcomes over here, it goes up. And if you get bad outcomes over here, it goes down. So I would say that the person who selected this, or let's maybe this is somebody's portfolio results, I would say that that investor has no skill. We, we use the term, in our industry, we use the term alpha. Alpha is personal skill, the ability to add to returns through some way other than taking on more risk. It's easy to add to the expectation of returns by buying riskier things. Riskier things are always expected to have higher returns or else nobody will invest in them, but they don't always deliver, and that's why they're called risky. But So you can easily increase the expected return on your portfolio by taking more risk. Rather than buying a one-year bond, you buy a 10-year bond. Now, more bad things can happen over 10 years than over one year. That's why 10-year bonds usually have yields which are higher than one-year bonds. And so, you know, when I went to University of Chicago, we all saw something like this. This is the return and this is the risk. And, you know, it is expected that riskier things will offer higher returns in order to induce people to make the investment. If I came here and I said, look, Oak Tree has two great products to sell you. We'll sell you a treasury bill fund where you can make 7%, or we have a venture capital fund where we're gonna to try to find the greatest technologies, and if everything goes right, we'll make you 7%. Well, everybody would take the T-bill fund because everybody prefers a sure seven to a risky seven. If we, if we look at something which is riskier, we expect it to offer a, a, a superior return, but because we know it, it, it doesn't necessarily have to produce it, that's why we say it's riskier. Anyway, to return to this. So this is, this is somebody who doesn't have any skill because they, they, they lose just as much money when things go bad as they make when things go well. I think that the mark of the superior investor is something I call asymmetry, which is, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the superior investor maybe makes a little less in the good times 
but doesn't lose in the bad. So this is, this is a superior investment result. By the way, there are some people who are superior because they, they make a lot more in the good times and they lose, but not a lot more in the bad times. That's another way to have a superior record. So it's not just conservative people who can be superior, but I think that making money in the markets is not hard. Returns are, everybody makes a lot of money in the good years, and at least in America, seven or eight out of 10 years are good years. Everybody makes money. Making money is not hard. The challenge, in my opinion, and the mark of the superior investor is the ability to make money in the good years with the risk under control so that if the next year turns out to be a bad year, you don't give back. And uh, so, you know, it's the difference really between, uh, let's say, uh, I hire these two guys. I have a business and I have a, a, f a fleet of trucks and uh, I hire these two guys to manage the fleet. And this person buys a bunch of trucks and, and takes out insurance and produces a certain cost per mile. This guy buys the trucks, doesn't take insurance. He produces a lower cost per mile in the years when there is no accidents, but every once in a while there's a fabulous accident and his cost per mile goes way up. I'd rather put my money with the manager who carried insurance. And so if you think about it, a, 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 a manager, an investment manager, who skillfully controls risk has insurance. Now some people say, well, why don't you just take out insurance in risky times? You know, and people say, I'm risk on, I'm risk off, I think high risk period, low risk period. And my answer, going back to the beginning, we never know when the risk periods are gonna be on. So we should have insurance all the time. And Oak Tree, in, in trying to be the dependable uh, manager in our asset classes, we believe that our risk control gives us insurance all the time. Sometimes it's not necessary. Did we waste money? I don't think so. Think about yourself. Everybody in this room, I assume, has a car. I assume everybody in this room has insurance on their car. Did you ever get to the end of the year and you say, damn, I wasted money, I had insurance this year and I didn't have an accident? No, we take comfort from the fact that we had insurance even if it didn't come to be needed that year. And that's the way I think of risk control. So I think that we should have risk control all the time. And so I think the superior investor is one who produces uh, an enviable record with risk control in force all the time. Great. Howard, could you share your view on whether specialization makes a difference in the investment process? The question was whether specialization uh, produces an advantage. And I, th I think, you know, I think, special I think specialization is really important. As I described to you, uh, Uh, can you hear from this? Yes. Okay. So when I became a, a, por a portfolio manager in the bond department. I was studying convertible bonds. There was a relatively small number of them. I could know a lot about all of them. But, and I think that is a better route to investment success than trying to know about everything. You know, and I used to have a clipping up on the wall above my desk. And it said, an analyst is something, somebody who knows uh, uh, you know, uh, a lot about a few things and learns more and more about less and less until he knows everything about a few things. But a, a, you know, a generalist is somebody who knows a little bit about a lot of things and learns less and less about more and more until he know, knows nothing about everything. And <clears throat> I think if, that if you, if you accept the emphasis on the knowledge advantage, then I think it has to come through specialization uh, rather than through uh, trying to know a little about everything. Okay, great. 
So the value versus growth has always been a hot topic. Over the past decade or so, we've been observing growth outperforming a lot value. However, the rising global inflation and the risk of a global stagflation is bringing some questions towards investors' minds if it's worth to have a structural growth location into their portfolios. Could you tell us what you think about those concepts and how does this apply to Oak Tree uh, investment process? Let's go back to what happened to me in the 70s. Um, you know, in the, in the period when the Nifty 50 were successful and they outperformed everything and they, people said, well, that's all you need, growth stocks. Similarly, the, the growth stocks led the recovery. Uh, I mean, they, the growth stocks have outperformed value uh, for most of the last 10 years, uh, maybe all of the last 10 years, uh, until the last year. And they did the best in the recovery from the pandemic. And uh, the, you know, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, uh, Google, uh, Microsoft, uh, the FANGs, it was easier to say when, when Netflix was in there and it was FANGs, but the FANGs, uh, you know, everybody said uh, at the end of 2020, that's all you need. But then now they've done the worst. And usually what happens in, our, in the investment business is that things that do the best for a while tend to do the worst for a little while. And I think that, you know, let's go back. People, you would say, growth is good, value is bad. There's nothing good or bad. It's all dependent on the relative price. And I think that every once in a while, uh, and look, look, a, a, real, a real growth stock from a company that really grows for a long period of time is enormously valuable. And so they do better for a while. But then, when people love them too much, they become too expensive and they begin to do worse. Nothing is going to do better forever. Uh, because if, no matter how good something is fundamentally, if people love it and love it and love it, buy it, buy it, buy it, and fo force it up to continuously to a higher and higher price, it gets, it, everything will become overvalued to the point where it's not a good idea anymore. Uh, again, it's not what you buy, it's what you pay. But I think that it's important, uh, desirable, to be open to both. Now, I wrote a memo about this in January of 21 called Something of Value. And uh, it was a reference to the fact that it, when the pandemic started, my son, who's a professional investor, and his family moved in with us. And we spent uh, three months, first three months of the pandemic living together. And we had a lot of debates about this. And he's he, he's a tech guy, a venture capitalist, and so forth. And, uh, you know, what, what the, he, he brought me this argument, and, and I really was impressed with his argument, uh, which is that the world had become closed-minded. And what people said is, I do growth, I don't do value, I do value, I don't do growth. And clearly, my experience shows the value of being open-minded and willing to do things if they're the cheapest. And, you know, and when I started with high-yield bonds, 90% of all organizations had a rule against buying non-investment grade bonds. But, of course, that's what meant there, that's where the bargains were. And when we, you know, I, I, when p people say, I do this, I don't do that, there's a, there's a strong dividing line, and they never cross over, so they're not open-minded. And, in fact, what's happened in the last... Uh, 20, 30 years, you see, in the institutional investment world, pension funds, endowments, and that kind of thing, uh, and their consultants, it's easier to run systems if they're kind of hardwired. So in the institutional world in which I mostly work, most pension funds, they say, well, we have a bucket for growth stocks and a bucket for value stocks, and a bucket for large growth stocks and one for small growth stocks. One for large value stocks, one for small value stocks. We have one for value stocks international, growth stocks international. It's all very siloed. We say buckets. And it makes life easy when you have buckets. Life is more challenging when you don't have hard boundaries. So you look at S&P. They take the S&P 500 and they create two indices, S&P value, and S&P growth. Growth stocks are stocks that are 
rapidly growing, of course, um, and uh, uh, generally speaking, have uh, low uh, returns on book value and high P.E. ratios. Value stocks have low ratios of price to uh, earnings, sales, and book value. Well, so you're saying that a, that a fast-growing company can't be good value? Uh, and you know there are all these people out there who style themselves as value. And not only do they not buy technology, but they know if they bought technology, the clients would say, you're not really a value investor, are you? We're going to fire you. You know, uh, it's kind of like religion or or uh, politics. You have to be dogmatic. You know, and but I think that you will do better if you can be flexible. And so that memo, what it was really about was open-mindedness. And you know, Warren Buffett, who was the great value investor. Um, he always says, well, people ask him about technology stocks. He says, we put that on the, on, the, on the too hard pile. We don't understand technology. We don't try to invest in it. So everybody says, well, that's it. Value means not te no technology. Well, guess what? Buffett put hundreds of million dollars into Apple, and it was maybe his second biggest winner of all time. So the point is, he has rules. Rules are meant to be broken, and he breaks them. And uh, the, uh, I, I, I wrote uh, in, in that memo, I think it was, no, uh, yeah, I think it was, I, I mentioned uh, Bill Miller, who was a value investor, uh, distinguished by having beat, beaten the S&P for 15 years in a row. It's really hard to beat the S&P for two years, no less 15 years in a row. And, 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 uh, but he did extremely well, as I recall, in 99, in the year leading up to the peak of the tech bubble. And I ran into him and I said, you know, I, I see you bought uh, Amazon and Apple and, and so forth. I said, how can you buy those stocks as a value manager? He says, look like value to me. Now, maybe he got lucky, or maybe, maybe he made a skillful judgment that a stock with a P.E. ratio of 40, growing at 30% a year, can represent good value. Um, but uh, I just think that, that uh, we should be open-minded uh, and not, and not uh, say, no, I do this, I don't do that. Okay, let's talk about macro outlook now. Howard, we just went through a global pandemic that brought the economic ground to a screeching halt to control the virus. And now we are facing an environment with geopolitical conflict and generalized inflation that has completely changed the economic cycle. Where do you think we are in the market cycle, that said? And do you think this is different from an ordinary cycle? All right, now having said that I don't believe in macro forecasts, so I'll, I'll, I'll comment on that. Um, when I look at the U.S. economy, there are pluses and minuses, but I think we're okay. We have inflation today, uh, and people are very upset, and we have, we have inflation at, at nine today. Uh, and, uh, of course, I lived through the 70s when we have inflation of around 15. And it was a very difficult period. But I don't think that this period is as bad. Uh, and I think that the uh, inflation, which was running sub-2 for many years, and by the way, most governments want 2% inflation because, number one, it contributes to growth in the nominal numbers, of course. And number two, it makes it easier to pay your debts. If, if you owe uh, a certain number of dollars and the dollar becomes less valuable every year, then you can pay off your debts with less purchasing power. Um, most economies of the world wanted 2% in the years leading up to the pandemic, and they couldn't get it. They could not uh, arrange it. So uh, my first conclusion about inflation is that it's very mysterious. No, when you want it, you can't cause it. Uh, and, and, and 
what we saw in the 70s is when you have it, it's hard to stop it. Uh, so, so mysterious. But having said that, I believe that um, a lot, the primary cause of the uh, inflation we're having today is the pandemic. And as you mentioned, uh, we shut down the economy. And if you think about a machine, let's say you have a generator in your basement and you shut it down, you don't run it for a few years. You go downstairs, you flip the switch, it doesn't do so great. You know, it's, it sputters and it's kind of rough and maybe it doesn't start and you have to call the repairman. So, you know, there was no reason in, in, in starting up the economy from a dead stop to think that it's gonna function smoothly. And it, and it didn't. And so we had what, what has come to be called supply chain interruptions. At the same time, I don't know what happened in Brazil, but in America, the government went on a program of giving out money to ensure that people would have money to spend and that would re restart the economy by purchasing. Um, and of, of course, the government wanted to, to ease the burden of people who were hurt by the pandemic. However, if you look, for example, at the third of the three relief programs, um, I think about 20% of the US population was hurt by the pandemic economically in terms of losing jobs, losing income, uh, et cetera. And the government gave out money to 80% of the population. So 60% of the population got money for nothing. And 60% of the population were better off economically with the pandemic than without it. So these people got this money. By the way, they couldn't spend it because you couldn't go on a trip. And, and you weren't in the mood to buy a car and so forth. So they put it in the bank and it piled up in the bank along with their desire to go out and have some fun. So when the vaccines came along and, and the, the pandemic was seen as being uh, under control in 21, we had an unusual surge of spending at a time when the shutdown machine of supply restrained the supply. Strong demand, weak supply, that's the formula for higher prices. It's very simple. That's the first thing you learn in, in microeconomics. Um, so we had that. And uh, it, you know, it came as a, a very great surprise. It was paradoxical. 2020, the year of the pandemic in the US, was the best year for disposable income in 20 years. And a lot of it was accumulated and carried into 21 and spent in 21. So we had a very strong demand and, and weak supply. At the same time, uh, so, uh, and, and these things will recede over time. Over time, people will spend that extra money and it'll be gone. And over, over time, the supply mechanism will catch up and d demand will come down, supply will come up and price increases will moderate. Uh, we, uh, at the same time, we have exogenous uh, influences like Ukraine, uh, and the Ukraine war means that we're not buying so much energy from Russia anymore, and uh, so the price of oil spiked, and now that's coming down, and the price of gasoline uh, to the consumer is coming down in the States. Um, so these are all influences that I think will recede. On the other hand, uh, I do think that there's been a change in how people think about work. And I think that a lot of uh, people uh, of all ages uh, have, after the, after the experience of 2020, said, I like working at home. I don't like commuting. I don't like go to work. I'm just not that into work anymore or my career or making money. And at the margin, some people have left the workforce which means right now in the States, we have a lot of empty jobs and not too many people to fill them. So we have the lowest, you know, I think unemployment was three and a half before the pandemic. It went up to about 15. And, and you know, everybody said, oh, it's gonna be years and years until it comes back down. It's back to three and a half, which is the lowest unemployment in 50 years. Uh, which means that, that labor has a lot of bargaining power. If, if, you know, if, the, if you have five jobs open and there you find one candidate, a lot of people are gonna to compete to get that candidate. That candidate has a lot of negotiating power. And that will, may last longer than the other uh, influences that I mentioned. Um, 
Uh, and then the last thing, which is the wild card, is uh, uh, what we call inflationary expectations. And when, it, when, you know, when people start to conclude that there's going to be inflation, what do they say? Prices will be higher next year than they are this year. I'm going to go out and buy. What does their buying do? It makes prices go up. So uh, s uh, inflationary expectations can become embedded and can be self-fulfilling. And once they're embedded, it's hard to get rid of them. So that, that is an argument that the inflation will not disappear. Uh, and most observers, including me, think that inflation will be lower six or 12 months from now than it is today. The Fed's program of raising rates and, and quantitative tightening is expected to contribute to that. Um, uh, but probably not sub two, and not two, and maybe not three, maybe four. Uh, well, if that's true, the, the Fed has embarked on a campaign of raising interest rates to uh, choke off the inflation. Uh, now people have flipped to saying, well, I think the Fed, it, I think it's going to go so well that the Fed will turn dovish again in January and start cutting rates again. And that's why the stock market did so well at the end of last week. But uh, you know, that seems to be uh, overly optimistic. And, and, and anyway, I don't know. So th the bottom line is I think our economy is okay. I think that inflation will recede, which will permit the Fed to be less hawkish. Uh, now, we still have the exogenous things to worry about, like Ukraine and the U.S. tensions with China. but. We'll always have those, and the world always seems like a mess, and, uh, and the world always seems worse than it did 20, 10 years ago, but uh, it, it may or may not be true. Um, but so when I think about positioning, and I talked about uh, should you be more aggressive than usual or more defensive than usual, I, when I take it all together, I'm kind of in a normal place. And uh, there are, I think that the, the, the e economy as a whole taken together argues for uh, that we don't need more caution, and the international situation argues that we do, and I take it together, and, uh, and I just think we're, uh, we're asserting our normal mm. caution at Oak Tree. Great. So we're running out of time. Let me ask you a final question. I remember you saying that when you started writing your memos back in the early 90s, you spent a couple of years or more writing them without even knowing that people were reading it until you get a finally a uh, reply from, from a client. And fast forward to today, we have a digital version and audio version available technically at the same time. And within a couple of hours, you can know who your audience is, where they are, and what are the interests. So given that whole digital transformation of your mammals uh, and living in, a, in an era that we have data widely uh, available, and we see sectors being disrupted by leaner and faster players, how do you see our industry of investment management in a couple of years, given that whole background? The point is, uh, you know, when I went to the University of Chicago 55 years ago, what the, th that they said is that most active investors don't beat the market before fees, and then if they charge substantial fees, they do worse than the market. So why not just buy a little bit of every sh share in the market? Uh, that's, that's the thinking that gave rise to the first uh, index fund, which was Vanguard's uh, fund by Jack Bogle, which really was commercialized in 1974. And um, you know, I, the, the figure I read most recently is that 83% of active managers uh, are, do worse than the market. And this is the reason why most equity management uh, has uh, most, most U.S. equity mutual fund capital is now pa managed passively, indexed or managed passively, because people were charging high fees and not adding value. Uh, and so now most of the money is run passively without any effort on the part of a manager and with extremely low management fees. And I think that, that in most cases, that's a better idea. You know, in America, we have an author named Garrison Keeler, and he wrote a book about a fictional town called Lake Wobegon. And he said in Lake Wobegon, 
all the children are above average. Uh, of course, in the investment business, everybody claims to be above average, but most people are not. And most fees were, have been very high in the past, and most people didn't earn those fees. And that's why the world ch changed to passive. And, you know, everybody is, is captivated by the idea of finding the next Warren Buffett who will make them rich. Most managers clearly are not going to make anybody rich. And I think it's a better idea to A, control the costs, B, invest in, in products that are what I would call competent, that will professionally deliver steady results over time without expecting brilliance, because brilliance is rather rare. Yeah. And it's a, the worst thing in the world, of course, is to pay for brilliance when it's not real. So I think that, you know, and, and, and of course, uh, you know, online delivery of financial systems uh, of those competent products is going to be very important. And th so the delivery of competent products online at low cost, I think, is going to be very important as we move forward. Now, I believe that there are a small number of people who can make an exceptional contribution, which is worth paying for. Uh, I hope to believe we're among them. Uh, but um, so I think that uh, for, you know, th the most important thing for most people is to be investing and in the market steadily over time. And don't screw it up by getting in and getting out and getting in and getting out and change strategies to this strategy and that strategy and that strategy. And in the memo that came out last week, I said, if you wait at a bus stop long enough, you'll eventually catch a bus. If you run from bus stop to bus stop, you may never catch a bus. So I would say invest and stay with it. Bill Miller, who I referred to as having beaten the S&P for so many years, he had a great line, which I used in, in in a memo recently, I, he says it's time, not timing, that produces wealth. And no, very few people have shown any success at getting in and out of the market. Uh, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, try to do that uh, if I were you. Um, but I believe, so steady investing in competent products at a low cost is, is a great idea. Once you have established an investment program, it's not unreasonable to add hopefully special products that can s kind of add to the uh, returns more than they add to the risk, asymmetry. Uh, that's kind of the next, the next level of effort, and I think it's worthwhile. And you look at, at the so-called alternative investments like private equity, venture capital, distressed debt, real estate, um, uh, things like that. Uh, I, I, I think it's possible to increment uh, the outcomes in that way. And, and uh, it's not for everybody, uh, but once people gain a certain uh, kind of critical mass of financial assets and of expertise, I think it's worth trying. That was great. Thank you. So I would like to ask uh, Ajusum to say some final words here. And we have also a gift for you. Do we have time for any questions? Yeah, actually, we're running. Ran out of time. Oh, okay. I, I don't. I don't know if anyone would like to ask a question. We have two questions for the yeah. audience. Yeah. Good. Okay. Who has the best question? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody? Yes. Uh, when you see your actions on 2024, uh, the election of 2024. Well, I think that the U.S. Uh, political outlook is unusually murky. Uh, I think that. If you wanted to place a bet today on who the candidates would be, you would have to bet Biden and Trump. Uh, I think it's safe to say that huge numbers of people don't want either. Uh, uh, but the way political momentum and the machinery uh, operates, I think that's, that's who you're most likely to get. Um, and, uh, you know, look, I'm, I'm a Democrat. And uh, I honestly believe that when you have an authoritarian strongman, uh, you have the risk of uh, taking over. And, and, and 
democracy being diminished. And you have somebody in Trump who says the election was stolen. He went to court 60 or 70 times. He lost all 60 or 70 lawsuits. Why? Because he didn't produce any evidence. You would think that if there's evidence that he would have produced it and won two of the 60, but he didn't produce any evidence. So how can he go on st still saying that the election was stolen? And how can 30% of the electorate believe him? 30% is 100 million people believe that the election was stolen. So, uh, and, and, and you know, the Republican Party, I believe, is trying to elect people to state offices. The states control the elections. And there are people who have said, basically, their, their campaign promise is, no matter what the outcome is, I'll, I'll vote Republican. I'll say the Republicans won. I don't think that's a great thing for democracy. Uh, on the other hand, um, um, you know, Joe Biden uh, appears to have been weak so far, has not really shown any energy. People talk about his age. He's like 80 uh, already. And, uh, and uh, the uh, Democratic Party is uh, kind of being held hostage by the far left uh, progressive wing, uh, which is a small minority of the people, but very, uh, they, they, they've scared the politicians because in a few races, uh, established long-term uh, Democrats were thrown out. Uh, the most famous case is somebody called, uh, uh, Alice, uh, what's her name, uh, Alessandra Ocasio-Cortez, uh, whose qualification was that she was a, a bartender. And, 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 and a long-term, like 20-year uh, Democratic congressman was unseated in her district by her because, you know, it's, as we may know, it's easy for politicians to promise that they're gonna give out stuff and make everybody's lives better. It's, it's hard to deliver it. Uh, but so, you know, right now the choice between Biden, and so Biden is not a progressive, but he has maybe accommodated the progressives more than he should have, uh, and has disappointed the mainstream of the Democratic Party. So you have two candidates, two likely candidates right now, who neither of whom looks great. I think what that means is you're gonna have a lot of surprises. And uh, I don't know who the candidates are gonna be, but there's gonna be very uh, tumultuous primaries in both parties. Yeah. What's your view on, on the neutral re rates in the US? Has, has it changed? On the what race? The neutral rate, the equilibrium rate of the US economy. Uh, the growth rate of GDP. Oh, interest rates. Oh, uh, well, you know, I, I think that, that, that the neutral rate is, I mean, first of all, I'm a believer in it. And I think that the, I don't, I don't like having a, what I would call an activist central bank. And if I were running the central bank, which I'm not a candidate for, uh, I, would, I would go to something like the neutral rate and just leave it alone. And, you know, <laughs> Let me just draw you another picture if I can indulge myself for a minute. Thank you. So, economy kind of goes like this. 3%, 1%, 3%, minus one, you know, very small fluctuations. And the activist looks at it like this and says, when you're, he when you're below some imaginary, maybe it's a 2% line, you should stimulate. And when, it, when you're above it, you should, uh, uh, sh you should shrink it. And uh, so the activist always finds something to do. What I would rather see is that there's a range here, which is kind of the moderate range when you do nothing. You leave it alone. Because look, I'm a believer in capitalism. And I think, I ho hopefully everybody in this room is a believer in capitalism. If, you, if not, you, you came to the wrong meeting. Uh, <laughs> but but the, the belief in capitalism is based on the belief that the free market is the best allocator of resources. And it sets the price 
where which w based on market forces and that causes the resource to move to the right use. We haven't had a free market in money in the last 13 years, ever since the global financial crisis and, and before. And so money has been made too cheap for the last 13 years. And as a result, the saver doesn't get enough interest and the borrower is subsidized. And I don't think that's desirable. So I would let, I would let in interest rates move to their natural rate, which I think is like the neutral rate, and uh, leave it alone. Except, you know, there's a, when the market gets going too f hot, t the old saying is we take away the punch bowl at the party and stop people from drinking. And the way d they've done that in the past by raising interest rates or margin requirements or something like that. And when the margin, when the mar when the economy is too weak, then we squirt in some liquidity and stimulate it to do better. But most of the time, leave it alone and let natural forces uh, uh, work, and and that includes the in interest rates. So it hasn't changed. No, I don't think. Oh, I, yeah. Your question was whether it changed. There's no reason to think it's changed. No, I don't think so. This is a very long-term phenomenon. Well, thank you all for being with me this morning, and I, I hope that was helpful. Uh. Good. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Marcus, for guiding this. Howard, again, uh, thank you very much for uh, giving us those shareful insights. It's very, very a pleasure having you here again. And thank you, especially here, GAM Investimentos, Oktri, Daniel, Marcela, as well, Bernardo. All here with us, we are almost 40 people here in the room, and we have as well a virtual room, over 500 people. And before letting you go, I would like to uh, give you a gift in name of Bordesco. It is uh, a very special asset for the Brazilian. Yeah, 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 it is. <laughs> I, I appreciate my relationship with Bradesco and yeah. its people and its clients, and uh, I hope to continue that relationship, and I thank you for the shirt. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys.